what does it mean that Jesus is our Redeemer? And that might be one of those kind of churchy words that we hear and we know it refers to Jesus, but we don't really think a whole lot about what that term means. Well, did you know that God gave us a whole book in the Bible to try to explain what it means that Jesus is our Redeemer? And of course, we learn other things from this book, too. But that primary theme uh, of goes throughout this book, and that's the book of Ruth. Now, the book of Ruth takes place during the period of the Judges, and so that's why following our quick study through the book of Judges, now we come to the book of Ruth. And really, the book of Ruth is a love story. And isn't it cool that God has chosen to teach us through stories? that he understands that often we learn things in a different way as we hear a story. And of course, a reminder that when we talk about these things in the Bible being stories, they are stories, but they're true stories. They're history. Or as I've heard it said, they're his story. The story of how God has acted in our world, acted in the lives of people to accomplish his purpose. And so this story, this love story of Ruth, illustrates what redemption is about. But before we dive into Ruth, I just kind of want to, I guess, discuss how God communicates with us a little bit. You see, there are lots of those titles we use for Jesus. I mentioned Redeemer, or there's others like Messiah, Lord, Great High Priest. And each one of those titles... It has a lot of background to them. And as we better understand the background to those titles for Jesus, then we understand better what Jesus has done for us. Much of the background of these titles comes from the Old Testament. And as I started to understand this, as I started to see this in the Old Testament, it helped make the Old Testament more exciting for me to study. Because the truth is, as you study many portions of the Old Testament, you kind of wonder what's going on. You have a tough time keeping track of all of the different people in there. Some of the passages in the Old Testament are just plain hard to read. But when we can keep in mind that in the Old Testament, that God is laying the groundwork for Jesus our Savior. And he's teaching us through the Old Testament about how much we need a Savior then suddenly studying it, it should be more exciting for us. Because as we do so, we're actually learning more about Jesus. Studying the Old Testament helps us better understand how beautiful Jesus is. And so God has gone to a lot of work. Well, it's funny when you use human terms for God. Obviously, it's not like God was overexerting himself to do this. But you could say that God has gone to great effort to explain in different ways what Jesus has done for us and what Jesus is still doing, saving us. You see, God wants us to have a strong and a deep understanding of what it means that Jesus has saved us. And the truth is probably those of us who have grown up in the church, those of us who have known Jesus for a long time, we can almost get kind of bored with this idea. We understand, yes, Jesus came and he died for my sins, and that's really great. But we don't necessarily seem real excited about it. But really, the Christian life is about understanding more and more just how much Jesus has saved us from. How Jesus has saved us from sin, yes. But how he's also saved us from death and from hopelessness. uh, From meaninglessness. From purposelessness. He saved us from bitterness and holding on to the wrongs other people have done against us. He saves us uh, from the selfishness that we see in our lives, creating all kinds of pain for other people. He saves us from all kinds of different brokenness in our lives. 
And as we get to know Jesus better, he brings healing and he brings wholeness to those broken situations. You see, God wants us to be excited about what he has done for us. I was telling the council at our last meeting that sometimes we might be excited about what Jesus has done, but we kind of forget to tell our faces. And maybe more accurately, we forget to tell our hearts. That in theory up here, we know it should be the best news ever. But in practice, we get more excited about the football game or the golf team going to state or the great sale at your favorite store. We don't act like it's really that exciting. But wouldn't it be great if we were known as a church where we were really, truly excited about what Jesus has done for us? And I mention all of that because, again, the book of Ruth is one way that God has given us to help us understand better how amazing Jesus is. So as we go through this book, I'm just going to keep it simple. First, I'll describe a woman that needed to be redeemed. And then secondly, a man to redeem her. So first, the woman to redeem. But before we get to Ruth, we really have to learn about her mother-in-law, Naomi. You see, Naomi had gone to Moab. That was a country uh, outside of Israel. Her and her husband, Elimelech, had gone there during a time of famine in Israel where there wasn't enough food. And then her two sons married women from this other country. They married Moabite women. And then tragedy struck. Then somehow all three of those men died. Naomi's husband and her two sons. And so that left Naomi and her two daughters-in-law, Orpah and Ruth. And so Naomi had heard that things had gotten better back in Israel, and so she decides to go back there. But she encourages her daughters-in-law to to stay in their homeland, that they don't need to come with her. And after a lot of convincing, Orpah does decide to stay back with her family. But Ruth is determined to follow Naomi and to go with her. And you might be familiar with this passage. It's a beautiful passage that shows Ruth's loyalty to Naomi in Ruth 1, 16 through 17. But Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go, and where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there will I be buried. May the Lord do so to me and more also, if anything but death parts me from you. And so we see some of the character of Ruth there, her great loyalty to her mother-in-law. So Naomi and Ruth, they travel and they arrive in Israel. And then, but they arrive with next to nothing. And so they have to fend for food. And so Ruth goes gleaning. And basically the practice at that time was to care for those who were poor, to care for those who didn't have enough food. They were allowed to go into the field behind the people who were harvesting and to pick up the leftovers, to pick up the grain that was missed by them. And so Ruth goes to do this. And she ends up in the field of a man named Boaz. And he's kind to her. He's generous to her. He gives her extra grain. He gives her food. And Ruth returns and she tells her mother-in-law, Naomi, about Boaz. And Naomi mentions that he is a relative. And actually, He is a redeemer. And that's where we begin to see this theme of redemption in this story. So I should just explain kind of the practice about redeeming at that time. These were laws that had been commanded by God in order to properly care for people. And so some of the practice was that if someone had to sell some land that belonged to them, say they suddenly came upon hard times financially, so they had to sell some of their property, then a close relative could go and buy that property back in order to keep that land in the family, in order to redeem that land. 
Or sometimes people would get so desperate, so poor, that they would end up selling themselves into slavery to another person. And that close relative, a redeemer, could go and buy them back, buy them out of slavery. And so imagine being so desperate, so poor, that you had to sell yourself into slavery, sell yourself to go serve someone else. And then you have a relative who is willing to pay the price to buy you back. And so even in this law that God had set up, we see a beautiful picture of Jesus. That you and I, on our own, we were slaves to sin. We were slaves to the devil. We were stuck, we couldn't get out, and Jesus paid the price that was needed to buy us back. And the price that was needed was his very own blood. So you start to see how all of this really ends up pointing to Jesus. Now, over time, this law of redemption, or sometimes they talk about the kinsman redeemer, that was the person who could go redeem the land or redeem the person who had sold themselves into slavery. Over time, this came to be connected with another law. And this law said that if a man was married and he and his wife didn't have a son— and then the man died, that that man's brother should go and marry his wife, marry the widow. And that was for the purpose of then, hopefully that brother would have a son with the widow and carry on the family name for that brother who had died. And so that had kind of come to be combined with this law about the Redeemer. And that's what's going on here in the book of Ruth, as you'll see. So Naomi and Ruth, they were in a desperate situation. They were these two widowed women in a new land. Naomi hadn't been there for years. Ruth had never lived there in Israel. And they hardly have anything. They're desperate. And Naomi hears about Boaz, and suddenly she has hope. She sees a way that maybe their situation can be improved. Boaz has shown kindness to them, and he's a close relative who could serve as this redeemer. And so Ruth, ge- so Naomi gives Ruth some instructions. And, and they're kind of weird instructions to us. So I'd ask you just to remember that that was a different culture. These things meant something different at that point. But here's what she tells Ruth to do. She says, go to the threshing floor. That'd be where they were beating out the grain to get rid of the chaff, the parts that they didn't eat. That's how they processed their crop. Go there where Boaz is processing the crop. And then wait for him to eat and drink, to have his meal at the end of the night. And then wait for him to lie down. And then go uncover his feet and lay down at his feet. And so Ruth, she goes and does this. And then Boaz wakes up at midnight and is startled. There's this strange woman laying at his feet. And and so he asks what's going on. They talk. And Naomi and Ruth, I'm sorry, Ruth, asks Boaz to serve as the Redeemer. Asks him to marry her. And Boaz, his response is that he's willing to do that. But there's actually a closer relative who first has the right to serve as that redeemer, and and he needs to check with that relative before he can move ahead with that. So we've talked, we've described this woman who needed to be redeemed. And now we have Boaz, who is the man to redeem her. Boaz, the next morning, he meets with this relative. And then we learn one more detail. Apparently, Naomi In addition to having Ruth to redeem, apparently Naomi, either she had sold or was going to sell one of their fields. And so this plays into it. And Boaz tells this other man that, you know, this field either has been sold or it's going to be sold. And would you like to serve as the redeemer? Would you like to buy that field? And the man says, sure, I'll do that. But then Boaz mentions, but there's one other detail. There's Ruth. And it's kind of a package deal. If you want the field, then you marry Ruth too. And the guy's not willing to do that. 
And so now Boaz is free to serve as Ruth's redeemer. So Boaz goes ahead and he buys the land. And then he marries Ruth. He marries Ruth, this beautiful, caring, loyal, hard-working, hard-working woman who had tragically lost her husband. Isn't that a sweet love story? Doesn't it beat any Hallmark movie? But remember, there's something deeper going on here than just the love story between Ruth and Boaz. Think about it for a moment. Think about what it meant for Boaz to redeem Ruth. As Boaz redeemed Ruth, he was redeeming a broken and hopeless person. She was a woman who had lost her husband and then left her home. She was a stranger in a new land who had to pick up leftovers in the field in order to survive. And as Boaz redeemed her, suddenly Ruth was provided for. Instead of picking up leftovers, now she had more than enough. As Boaz redeemed her, he provided security for Ruth. Instead of being a vulnerable woman in a new country, now she had safety and protection. She had security. As Boaz redeemed her, he was providing a home for Ruth. Ruth was welcomed into the home of Boaz. As he redeemed her, he was providing a family for Ruth. Now Ruth had a new husband. As Boaz redeemed her, he was providing citizenship for Ruth. She was a foreigner from another country, and as she married Boaz, she joined the Israelite people. She belonged now. As Boaz redeemed her, he was providing a heritage for Ruth. Boaz and Ruth did end up having a son named Obed and carrying on the name of her first husband. And so all of this really is pointing ahead to a greater Redeemer. And there's two ways that this story points to Jesus. And I hope you're not getting tired of this week, this each week. Hopefully you're noticing that each week we study the Old Testament and then we see how it points ahead to Jesus. But hopefully you're not getting tired of it because, because again, that is the purpose of Scripture. That in the end it all points to Christ. So like I said, there's two ways that this points to Jesus, and it's really two ways that often in the Old Testament, uh, sorry, two ways that the Old Testament often points to Christ. One way is that it's the story of Jesus' family line. It's showing how one person led to another who led to another, and eventually Jesus came from that family line. And that's the case here. If you read it, Ruth four sixteen through 17, it says, Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her lap and became his nurse. And the women of the neighborhood gave him a name, saying, A son has been born to Naomi. And that's really a son has been born to Ruth, and now Naomi has a grandson, is what they're saying. They named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. And so at the end of this book, it connects Ruth to King David. King David, who was the greatest king of Israel. Basically, it's saying, Ruth, yes, it's a great love story, but she's not just some random person out there. She's connected to this really important guy, David. But in being connected to David, it also shows that Ruth is an ancestor of a greater king and a greater redeemer. And that was Jesus. Because from David's line, Jesus later came. David, and therefore Obed, was Jesus' great, 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 a whole lot of greats, grandfather. And one other thing we see here is that once again, God, he had his chosen people, he had the Israelites, but he welcomed other nations to worship him. And so here, once again, God welcomes a foreigner into the Israelite people and into Jesus' family line. You could say God was redeeming the situation here. And it shows God's heart for all people, that all people would know him and be saved by him. 
So that's the one way that this story points to Jesus. It, it, talks, it gives us the history of Jesus' family. Someone suggested maybe that's a sign I'm supposed to be done. <laughs> I, at least I think that's what you're saying. <laughs> and, and normally I appreciate sit, people sitting up towards the front, but whoever it was can sit towards the back next week. <laughs> Your kids are giving you away. <laughs> but don't worry, I, I will wrap it up shortly here. So as I was saying, Boaz, serving as a redeemer, explains some things about how Christ serves as our redeemer. It, as Jesus redeems us, he redeems a broken and hopeless person like Ruth. It, as Jesus redeems us, he provides for us like Boaz provided for Ruth. Whereas, Boaz was, whereas Ruth was really hopeless, she was barely getting by. We in our lost condition, we were completely hopeless. We had no chance of providing for ourselves. We could not provide a way to be saved by ourselves. We couldn't provide a way to have a right relationship with God by ourselves. And so we needed someone to redeem us, to provide for us. And that was Christ. As Jesus redeemed us, he provided a home for us, an eternal home in heaven. As Jesus redeemed us, he provided a family for us. You really could say that as we were separated from God because of our sin, we were orphans. But as Jesus redeemed us, he provided a family for us. As we are now the brothers and sisters of Jesus. We are sons and daughters of God the Father. And we have brothers and sisters with all other Christians here. As Jesus redeemed us, he provided citizenship for us, again, in heaven. And he provided a heritage for us, provided something for us to pass on to the next generation. We get to pass on to our children the hope that Christ has given us. And then I especially want to focus on this one. As Jesus redeemed us, he gave us security. You see, Ruth, her situation was really not secure until Boaz redeemed her. Uh, again, she was a woman in a strange new land who was barely getting by, picking up leftovers in the field. Her future was really uncertain. Her future was insecure. But Boaz gave her security. It, and on our own, our, we have no security. But we can't make ourselves right with God. But we'd always be questioning, have I done well enough? Have I been good enough to please God? And really the answer is always no. No, you haven't done enough. No, you haven't done well enough. And so the only way for us to have security in our relationship with God, the only way for us to have security knowing we will go to heaven instead of just hoping that we might have been good enough, the only way for us to have security was for Christ to redeem us. For him to make our home in heaven secure. To make it sure because it's not based on what we've done, but based on what Christ did for us. And we also, even as believers who know we're going to heaven, we can sometimes go through life wondering, well, is God upset with me today? I kind of messed up there. Is God upset with me now? But because Christ has redeemed us, we have the security of knowing that no matter what we do, as we believe in Christ, we are accepted by God. And so we don't have to worry that I'm on God's good side one day and on his bad side another day. Christ has given us security in our relationship with God. 
and something as I've thought about this this week and thought about this theme of redemption, something that struck me is God's ability to redeem situations. Ruth and Naomi had a really broken situation. They had lost their husbands. And yet God made something beautiful out of it. And so that's for you. But when you look at your life and you see certain situations or certain areas where you really have brokenness, whether it's a sin you keep struggling with, whether it's tragedy that, that you've gone through in your life. We can trust that even though we might not understand it, that God is a redeeming God who can redeem those situations and make good out of them. He, he can make good out of our failures. Or maybe you try to serve God with your life, but you see your brokenness there too. That you're always messing up. You're, you're never sure you've done the right thing. I know for me, I can question whether I said something just right, whether I should have had, whether I should have, whether I should have said more, or whether I should have said less, whether I should have been quiet there, or whether I should have instead said something there. And there's all kinds of those things we can question as we try to serve God. We we're not sure always how to do it right, but we can trust that as we seek to serve God. He redeems even our feeble efforts, even our weak efforts to serve him, and he uses them for his glory. He redeems them. And we also need to remember that God is still in the business of redeeming people. And so as we look at broken situations in people around us, sometimes we're tempted to think, they're a lost cause. But we don't know how to help that situation. They seem beyond hope. And yet we can trust that God, again, he's still redeeming people and he can redeem those broken situations we see around us. And, and so, for believers here today, that Christ has redeemed you. And he wants to use you to redeem broken situations around you and to help others trust in Christ as their redeemer. And so as you get involved in this mission of redemption, the truth is you often no, won't know quite how to do it. You won't be sure that you're doing it right. You won't always have the right words to say. But our redeeming God will even redeem your confused and your weak efforts to serve him. And he will redeem them and he will use them, not because you are great, but because we serve a powerful and redeeming God. Amen.